Hello and welcome to the PropTech Hot Seat on iProperty Radio with myself, Carol Tallon, the show where we explore trends and technologies driving innovation across the built environment. The show is brought to you in partnership with PropTech Ireland, the hub for innovators, investors and indeed for industry leaders. In the PropTech Hot Seat today is William Young, Vice President at Navigator CRE, the commercial real estate business intelligence platform. Will, you're very welcome. I'm delighted you're able to join us today. Thanks so much for having me. So, Will, you might just give people, I, I we have actually interviewed uh, the company previously, and it, it's a company that is possibly well known um, in terms of its leadership for real estate business intelligence. But for anybody who's not familiar, you might just talk us through Navigator and the Navigator proposition. Yeah, absolutely. So Navigator is a data integration and visualization tool. That means a lot of different things for a lot of people, but where it starts is the connection of all the various data that sits around real estate, real estate portfolios, and real estate occupiers. From there, we can add on additional modules that cover all of the various reporting and visualization any organization needs, whether that's ad hoc internal reporting, whether it's regular external reporting, we have it all covered via a handful of dashboards and custom reports. Very good. You might just talk us through, you know, again, um, even now the conversation around real estate data has moved on so much. I still find there's a lack of understanding as to what that is. So you might just break it down as to the type of information that you're looking at across portfolios and why that's important. Yeah. So these, let's take asset managers, for example, they're going to be generating so much information at the tenant level, at the unit level, at the asset level, and at the portfolio level. And each of those are going to have various filtering needs, if you will, by strategy, by block type, by asset type, what have you. And there's so much information that it's hard to use all of it because oftentimes it comes out in a flat Excel file, and it falls to junior team members to sanitize the data, get it integrated with the more traditional financial data that, um, you know, senior team members are used to seeing. And then from there, you, you have to spend the time to drive insights. And all of that comes together to be a significant portion of a team's time. And a good portion is not value add activities. It's sanitizing the data, it's integrating the data, it's getting things into a a report format that is most useful versus just doing the value add insight generation and analysis of what data you're seeing and what the asset is trying to tell you or what the portfolio is trying to tell you. I um, I think that's a very compelling way of saying that it's not just about looking at this masses of data, you know, and you're right, it is difficult to use, um, especially when you don't know what you want to use it for, when you don't have an idea of the achieved aims. But I, I like that you position it as what is the asset trying to tell you? What's your portfolio trying to tell you? Because to be fair, data speaks. We're just not great at listening yet. And I think that's the stage of adoption um, that we're at. How is Navigator different to others in the marketplace? Yeah, our view is really that first, you need all the plumbing to get the data together. That is kind of table stakes. You have to have all the information around the assets, around the portfolio. But the next step becomes the access to the information. Kind of the the last mile of data is the visualization piece. How can I get this into a form that I can understand the story it's trying to tell me and I can position that for people who are not day to day in the information? You know, we think about data and the the value proposition of Navigator in two ways. One, it's identifying competitive advantages. Where am I outperforming my peers in a certain strategy, in a certain asset type with a certain type of tenant? Who knows what the answer is? But the second piece is risk mitigation, well, risk identification and mitigation. If you have a challenge within your portfolio, the time it takes to identify it and then address it is is potentially a huge, huge exposure factor for the health of a portfolio. If we can condense that timeline to be able to identify that, that risk or that poorly performing asset, you can trade out of it, 
you can mitigate the risk, you can, you know, make sure that you're well positioned on both sides of those barbells to identify risks and identify outperformance. And um, in terms of peer benchmarking, where does that data come from? So we don't do any benchmarking. What it's what it's really meant to do is identify trends within an asset within a portfolio. So if you see all of a sudden energy costs have spiked in a certain asset or even a certain unit, we need to go and investigate. We need to talk to the property managers. This is speaking from an asset manager seat. Go to the property managers and say, hey, we need to figure out what's going on because that is outside the bounds of what we would have expected. And that, especially in today's market, is a huge risk to NOI, which are which is already under pressure. And with cap rates expanding, it, it significantly impacts the value of the asset or portfolio. Okay. In terms of um, using the data to position for competitive advantage, one of the challenges with that in the marketplace right now is that there isn't a huge amount of data outside of the publicly traded companies, you know, what information is available, but very little at an asset level. So how are you, I suppose, uh, positioning towards even best practice, best performance within a building if you're only looking at your own portfolio? Yeah, it's a great question. We can do some comparison across different asset management teams if there's a significant enough portfolio. Um, We can also, you know, enable some creativity for these organizations. They see from their acquisitions and capital markets teams a lot more information than on just their portfolio. And absent a platform like Navigator, it is a big time suck to, to pull that data in and to try to utilize it. Now, if we can flow that data in automatically via Navigator's ingestion engine and get it into the reports and the visualizations, we can enable them to execute on that creativity for utilizing that data. So there's a couple of ways that we can do it. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right to touch on that. There's not a wealth of information specifically here in Europe on asset level performance. And so you do have to be a little bit dynamic in your analysis and a little bit more creative than others. Yeah, it, it, it's one of the challenges we're seeing at the moment. And I think it's given rise maybe to some criticism, particularly across uh, looking at ESG metrics. You know, it's given rise to the criticism of greenwashing, which I don't accept because actually where I see the, the portfolio owners who are uh, making the effort to do this, they're doing they don't have anything really to benchmark themselves against. And that's such that's such um, a difficulty. So essentially, they're doing the best that they can, the best standard they have. So in fact, and, and in some cases now, they're obviously leading the charge. So they become the benchmark for people yeah. to hit. But it's not ideal. You know, we definitely want uh, at, at this stage to have, um, you know, common metrics around uh, building performance uh, uh, that that can then be used uh, to establish best practice. It feels almost like a backwards way that we're doing it now at the moment, but we have to because we're being driven by compliance issues uh, and and others but it feels um it it feels like not the natural order to get something right um but again that's probably due to to where we are in terms of our um not just adoption of data but our understanding of the value of it and and um using it for insights in a way that that actually is pointing towards commercial decisions because at the moment we're seeing, and, and look, I see it in, in boardrooms every week, the data is there and there will always be somebody who will discount the data and try to take the conversation in in another, in another direction. We're not good at trusting the data yet. Um, is that something? Is that something I'm seeing in the Irish market? Obviously, you have a more global perspective. Where do you think the industry at large is in terms of being good at using and leveraging data? Well, I think you've touched on a few points that are really, really thoughtful in that, first of all, the data is sometimes really hard to get. And even if it's accessible, it's not necessarily usable. So we have to cross those two hurdles first before we can even start to try to generate analysis from the data. So I think as As an industry, we are making the right steps. We are getting better. 
the conversations I have are always more and more intelligent as the weeks and months go on because people are taking a look at this. The challenge is, is that the application to each specific organization, because each real estate organization is different, the application changes. And so each organization needs to figure out what's right for them and what is going to be most useful for them and their investors. So it does take a little bit more investigation, a little bit more analysis on how you're going to utilize the data and what data is going to move the needle. I mean, I can't tell you how many conversations I have with organizations who say, yeah, we generate all of this information, but I never even look at it because I just don't have time. And so a lot of it becomes, okay, how do we make it more efficient to utilize that information? Well, how did you get into this industry? Did you come from a real estate background? Uh, you could say so. You could say so. I started my career in finance and I was uh, in the banking world doing M&A for a little while. Then I joined a family office that was doing growth capital and real estate investing. And interestingly, we were users of Navigator on the real estate side and we invested in Navigator back in 2019 uh, in, the, in the seed round for Navigator. So I've seen it from a few different angles here. Oh, I love that. So actually, not only were you an investor in the company before you joined um, uh, and now you're in the role of vice president, but actually you were previously, before being an investor, you're, the firm you previously worked at was a user. We did, we did use it in, in a limited capacity, you know, as we were evaluating the investment opportunity on the growth capital side. So it was, it was a really, really unique opportunity uh, for me to see the business and get to know the team as well as understand the value proposition at large. That would be the holy grail for a startup. Um, you know, if they were to choose their journey, it would be that an early stage user is so convinced by not just what they can do, but by the potential that they become investors. And that investor is so committed, they actually join the company. I mean, that really is the holy grail of a partnership that grows together. What did so? I presume at that time, obviously, your company would have been using lots of different technologies from companies and would have been investors in lots of different startups and scaling companies. Yeah, so we we used a few different technology platforms, not a ton. Uh, we were very, very handy as our most with Excel. Um, you know, I've I've stolen this from our SVP of Platform and Ops, Colin Joint, but he says. Excel is the most widely used ERP system in commercial real estate. And he's totally right. He's totally right. And so we leveraged Excel as much as we possibly could. And then we were investors in, in a few other companies, uh, kind of broadly in the, in the tech world and, and in the more uh, kind of tech-enabled services world. You know, I'm not dismissive of that at all. I think actually um, it was those with a deep commitment to Excel were able to embrace the technologies um, as, as and when it was needed. So actually it was those who weren't even doing that well that struggled and maybe are still struggling and still haven't jumped that chasm. So um, I, I'm not dismissive of, um, of Excel in that respect. I actually think it became the foundation of most of the databases that we see are adding value to portfolios today. Um, so I just see this as, you know, like you said at the start, it's almost the uh, integration and the visualization then of that data, but actually the data still needs to be collected in a in a good, clear, clean way. Um, you know, so actually, the, the, I, I'm not dismissive of that at all. What was it about Navigator, the Navigator CRE, that you know what what was different about not just the technology but the team? Yeah, absolutely. So, just one more point on the on the Excel topic is that. I don't think Excel should be taken away from, from any organizations. I don't think you can replace Excel as a tool for finance at large. It is a fantastic tool at what it does. What it doesn't do a great job of is visualization and reporting. And that's where you can have tools that come in and help. So what we were impressed with at East Seattle Partners was the creative ability to integrate all the various data sources, so your ERP systems, your acquisitions pipeline, your ESG data, your leasing information, all of the relevant information that's coming in that you need to manage the portfolio, paired with your underwriting models, paired with 
your investor reports, all of that on the investment management side, all of that coming together and then being displayed in a visually appealing manner that you could see on your iPad, that you could put in front of the head of the firm, you could put in front of the, uh, you know, the investment committee to make sure deals got done or you were seeing the returns correctly. That was really, really impressive. And for us, we had been feeling those pain points in terms of access to information in a real-time uh, aggregated basis and having a tool that would bring together all that information and allow us to do kind of one-click reporting where necessary and, and a few clicks uh, filtering. That was something that was going to move the needle for our organization. And, and that's what we were most impressed with. Very good. And tell me then about the Navigator team, because it's a big transition to make from investor in a company to joining a company. How did that happen? Yeah, absolutely. So I joined the Navigator team, actually, to start with on the finance side, I was brought in to help raise our Series A. And we raised $17 million back in July of 2021 from a fantastic group of investors led by Fulcrum Equity Partners. And they have been hugely supportive to us as we continue to grow this market and continue to build the platform. And, you know, that was something where I wanted to really evaluate the direction of the business before I joined. And I was very, very comfortable with the team. And I was really impressed with the growth trajectory of the business, being able to come in and sell to some of these really large and technologically advanced organizations have our platform there driving reporting, driving at times board meetings, and enabling those organizations to generate outsized returns for their investors. That was, that was really, really impressive to me. Uh, you're currently based in London. Um, do you have clients in the Irish marketplace? Not in the Irish marketplace. We do have a few European clients. Uh, Ireland is a is a key tier one market for us over here in Europe, but we have not uh, cracked into that market just yet. Just yet. Any any uh, announcements on the horizon? I sure hope so. I sure hope so. Very good. Well, tell me, what is the long term vision for Navigator? Yeah, it's a great question. We want to be the leading data analytics and visualization tool for commercial real estate owners and occupiers. And what that means is building out our analytics suite to enable a variety of different persona types to utilize the information they need on a much more efficient basis. So enhancing a team's time and creating leverage for them to do what they do best and do less of what they don't need to be doing who, who or what is your ideal client? Yeah, so it, it looks different for the different persona types, if you will. But from an asset management perspective, groups with kind of above 200 million sterling of AUM start to have those data complexity issues and start to have those uh, team limitations on time to go and access that information. They're generating the complex data they need it integrated, but it's not a good use of junior teams, uh, team members' time to put all that information together. So we can quickly get in, connect to the ERP system, connect to the various Excel docs, add on various modules that they want to utilize to enhance their understanding of their portfolio in real time. From an occupier perspective, it looks like, you know, kind of 50 plus locations worldwide where they're trying to do lease administration, manage economic and physical occupancy, all of the relevant details on their owned and or leased portfolio to enhance their ability to manage their own p and um, And I suppose finally, given where we've come through, you know, we know the pandemic was such a huge accelerant. Um, it really, it, it opened the doors to so much more tech adoption for a whole range of reasons. What are you expecting to see in the marketplace over the next kind of 12 to 18 months? I think we're going to see a continued acceleration of technology adoption. This could be an optimistic viewpoint given where I sit, but the last call it nine to 12 months of economic turbulence, I think has made folks realize that, you know, the things that they were doing previously, while they were good enough, 
for not always putting them in the best possible position to enhance or accelerate their organization forward and manage their portfolios. So I think we've seen a bit of a slowdown recently with, with respect to tech spend, and that's understandable and probably expected given that investors have to turn to their internal portfolios to manage what's happening within the macroeconomic environment. But I think when we come out of this, investors will recognize that trying to report just on Excel, trying to access the data just with flat files is not going to be the most ex- most successful approach when you're trying to look forward and position yourself for 10, 20, 50, 100 years forward of an organization. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. Um, thanks a million, Will. I appreciate your time and insights today. And also, I think it was a really inspiring story maybe for startups who are just at the early stages of their fundraising to hear that actually, um, because we always talk about when taking in funding, whether it's uh, through angel or VC or otherwise, you know, the the strategic side of that funding is always somebody um, who can add value. And I think you're, the, you've are you really kind of shown an example of that today. So thanks a million for sharing that with us. And uh, that was Will, uh, William Young, Vice President at Navigator CRE. And that's it from us today. Um, my thanks to uh, Katie Tal and the production team at Hear Me Roar Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out the other real estate and construction shows on iProperty Radio. Before we go, I'd like to give a special thanks to PropTech Ireland, the PropTech hub for innovators, investors and industry leaders for making these conversations possible. And finally, thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you on the next episode of the PropTech Hot Seat here on iProperty Radio. <laughs>